being a shy person that I am, um, I want to introduce myself. My name is Maureen Wertheim, and Maureen is fine. I want to thank Matthew for arranging this. Um, I'm one of the people that is willing to travel, have GPS, and my friend Beverly, who helped me in and actually drove for me because I can't see very well. But I can see all the time. <laughs> um, as Matthew said, I belong to an organization called the Holocaust Speaker Bureau. And we go to schools, organizations from around the Carolinas and talk about the Holocaust to anyone who's willing to listen. So this is my commercial. If you have a place that you think we um, want to hear speakers, you can go on the website and look at, we all do different stories. We have all different stories. You can also get in touch with me, and I'd be glad to pass along any uh, phone numbers, emails, and websites uh, as well. And I have this speak up today, and it talks a little bit about local organizations, which may be wrong, but the bottom is the website. And the so, um, in the past, um, actual survivors came out to speak. And as you know, um, time is passing, and there are very few left to buy. Um, and the ones that are, are not traveling. Um, some organizations have groups come to those speakers. Um, so that's why I'm here today. And I'm also here today because I am the daughter of two Holocaust survivors, my mother and my father, and a big part of my family. Um, I'm going to share with you a little bit about what happened to specifically my mother, Charlotte, Batarak Wertheim during the Holocaust. And I'd like to start with a little bit of a review about what was going on before the Holocaust. And many of you know this, but bear with me, we'll all be on the same page about kind of what I'm talking about. It's very personal. Um, and I'm considered a 2G, second generation, especially with both my parents were Holocaust survivors, my grandparents, but I was born here. And one thing I learned very early on is there are many different kinds of casualties um, to survive, and different types of survivors of war. Um, I knew it was You're losing It's black. 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 It's Oh. Um, as a little girl in Germany before all the, the well, this is her at a point that I'll talk about. And um, that's her wedding picture with my dad. And this is her when she lived with me, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, so, very rarely smile, so we got this picture and we loaded it up. So, during the war, many people died in battle, they died from bombings. They died as prisoners. They died through mass shootings, starvation, disease, and in concentration camps. People attempt to save themselves in many, many ways. And I'm going to tell you what happened to my mother. To do this, as I said, I'm going to start with a little bit of background. Um, my mother was born October 8, 1931. She lived in a small town in eastern Germany with her mother, her father, her older brother, and her parental grandparents. This is an actual picture of their house, and the front was a, a store, and then they lived upstairs, and so did the grandparents, which is very common, um, especially in those days. And actually, the store, they were very modern people. They had cars, and now it's like, they weren't rich, but they weren't poor, you know? And um, their store sold modern things, like um, a washing sheet, where you have to, you know, yeah. And um, they sold farm equipment. So it was, you know, locally. And um, it was called Colton Dutch, and I'm not going to try the second one. <laughs> so, um, they went to school. They were very good citizens. They, you know, um, they considered themselves Germans who practiced Judaism as their religion. So, 
so when they heard stories about things that were happening all over um, Germany, they didn't believe that it could ever happen to them. I mean, oh, that's something happening over there, it's not going to happen to us. Um, and as you all know, there was no TV, no internet, no social media, no instantaneous news. They had to rely on newspapers that often were a few days late, because, you know, they weren't printed in that town, of course, it was way too small. So, there was no such thing as real-time news. This is, I'm going to briefly introduce the players. Um, that's my great-grandfather and my great-grandmother, who I knew, and I'll tell you a little bit about that as the story grows. Um, my, mo my mother is a little girl, her brother, and her parents, my maternal grandparents. And this is the couple, the parents, probably right before their wedding, they had portraits done. I have them. Um, now I'm going to talk about life was good for my mother as a small child, then all changed with the rise of Hitler and the Nazis. And this slide and many of my slides, the words are small. I'm going to speak to the parts that will help us go through the story, so don't strain yourself to try to read it. They're pretty common the timelines that you can find online or in books. So <clears throat> the Germans lost World War I. They, their country was decimated by bombing. They had to pay money called reparations to the victors and the winners while they rebuilt their cities, their economy, and their national pride. That's very important. So the former chancellor and other conservative leaders in Germany persuaded the president of Germany to appoint, not elect, um, Hitler as chancellor on January 30th, 1933. Shortly after that, the government began transforming the German Republic into Nazi Germany, a one-party dictatorship, a totalitarian and autocratic um, ideology of national socialism, which is um, a synonym for Nazism. Hitler was an amazing speaker. When he spoke, it was like you were mesmerized and um, just very energetic. So he started needing a scapegoat to rally the people around and um, to blame for Germany's troops because, you know, if, if the majority of people get on with you and, and they feel like if we get rid of these people, we'll be doing so much better. It just was easy to do. It was a very difficult time. Um, and, you know, we think about concentration camps, we think about the Holocaust. But actually, they started as um, a way to remove political people who disagreed with Hitler, to remove people um, who had an alternative lifestyle, LGBTQ, but mostly um, gay men. And um, anyone who opposed the government, in particular people who practiced different religions, Jews, Romans, which is a better way to call the gypsies, it's not okay anymore, and gays and handicapped people were targeted. Now my great-grandfather, the one with the white mustache, he was sent to concentration camp very early. He was sent home. He was emaciated, his big handle my mustache was gone, his head was shaved. This was a way to warn the other people, if you don't toe the line, and the Germans are very, and I can attest to this, this is one way we do things, and we keep it in order, and we take notes, and that kind of thing. And um, really, they have to do um, So, in 1933, the first concentration camps were put in ongoing, and not sending people back. They had um, forced labor. They had transit, transit like um, concentration camps that you would go to, and you were going to hold them <coughs> to go to other ones, and they started um, to have what is known as the death or killing centers, and that's pretty much what we know from movies and Spielberg movies and that. The people died from a variety of things. They died from hunger, a lot of disease, from being beaten, 
um, and as well as walking into um, the gas chamber. So it's September 1935. Things got extremely worse. Oops. I missed this. Um, let me go back. Um, there were a lot of laws that um, Jews had to follow. First of all, they had to be registered. They went in line, they were registered, they were all given the last name, like an identity card, like something can on to what's being talked about to have voting rights, you know, you have a picture, you have your address checked and that kind of thing. Well, they had identity cards, and they had to have identity cards on them. And one reason to kill someone in the streets is they didn't have their identity cards. And on their identity card, it was a big J, and it would be like Maureen, and it would say um, Sarah as my middle name, and then work. And men were um, John, and the Israel was their middle name, Smith. So they could easily buy identity. But more than that, they were required to wear this Star of David. And it had to be on the out of part of the clothes, um, especially because now the whole country was occupied by the German military and they joined in with the police and that kind of thing. So in a word, the Jews were easy targets. If you went up and beat up with a, a cut off a beard or Anything to do, it was it was patriotic. So um, and also because they were so readily available, identifiable, you wanted to scoop up a group and put them on the truck, and uh, they were gone. So um, this star was not a good thing to have, but now I'm very proud of it. This was my star. The star was given to me by my great grandmother when she survived concentration camp and she came to this country. And I have the real thing here today to show you. I'm going to leave it up here and you can take a look at it. But the little, you see the little threads and stuff? I didn't trim those off. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So we can um, take a closer look at the later choice. So all these laws were made to make life not only difficult and scary, but things got worse and worse um, for people who, I always loved this, they just practiced a different religion. They were German, my, my grandparents could not understand. You're German, you go to, to worship on a Saturday. You're German and you go to worship on Sunday. Why are you being killed? Well, as I said before, um, people did not want to believe. So when reality hit, it was this is my mother's brother, and um, one day he came home from school. He was all bloody and soaking wet. The kids were prompted. This was a patriotic thing to do: was to beat him up and throw him in the river. Well, at that moment, when you see your child, you know. They decided to start doing something about their living situation. And just being physically threatened, I think, made it very, very, very real. Um, one of the, you may have heard of Crystal Knot, Night of Broken Glass. That was on the evening of November 9th, 1938. And it was organized because all over Germany at the same time, this was happening in many, many towns. So it was preemptive. Um, my mother's family and many others were pulled out of their homes in the middle of the night. They stood there in their um, bed clothing and they stood around a bonfire where books were thrown in and they watched their synagogue or their house of worship go up in flames. Um, and an interesting fact, and I wish I had asked more questions about it, my mother, as a little girl, 
my grandmother and my great grandmother were put in a jail cell for 24 hours. I have a gut feeling that there were some sympathetic police there, and they knew my grandmother was a wonderful, giving person. I think they put them in jail to keep them safe. So the next day they were released, but you know, you're less than seven years old, I can't imagine being behind bars. Um, so these organized Jewish riots resulting in breaking the store front windows and that people were being shot in the street. Um, and then the next day, the Jewish people were required to pay fines and physically clean up the broken glass and all that. And of course, the taunting and the beatings continued. So my grandmother and my grandfather decided to send their kids to a sleepaway school that was in Frankfurt, which is a big city, still is a big city. And it, um, this isn't the school, but I'll tell you what this is in a moment. So they were away at school, and in 1939, my grandmother visited her children. And she took my mom shopping to a department store, you know, as it, as it was. Department stores were unknown. So she bought her um, some dresses. She gave her two, and she took two. She said, I'll see you, I'll see you soon. I'll see you in a couple of weeks, you know? And it was seven years, she saw it. And um, I have one of the dresses. This dress was one of the dresses that my grandmother bought for her mother, Charlotte's mother bought for her, and somehow saved. Um, it's got a lot of detailed pants on buttons. It's, I think it's a silk. And I didn't know, my parent, my mother let me dress up in this as a kid. Because she didn't talk about this. We didn't connect it with like being an artifact or anything like that. I have another one. I remember putting it on my dolls. And um, I'll talk about that later. So this is very dear to me. Um, so, it wasn't working out to have the Jewish children in that school. And they started something called a kinder transport, where kids were being taken by train. Oh, I don't know why that keeps going on. So, I'll hang in there with me. Okay. Um, my, I really didn't ask enough questions, so my grandmother, the one who bought the dresses, she was the last one in the family to leave. And it turns out that she supposedly, from what I can tell, left on the last boat that was allowed out of the harbor in Portugal. And she was went through a lot of customs and a little bit more than customs. And um, this necklace, they would have taken it. You know, they even like split the bottom of your coats because people were hiding things. I knew a man who hid diamonds in his the, this part of his pipe and as he was was trying to get away he was able to buy his way with these diamonds. So that was an incredible story. Well you all know cold cream when I talk to young people I know I can <laughs> and I think it was even Nivea. She pushed the necklace down and smoothed it over and I'm wearing it today. <laughs> And, and this was who? My mom. Oh, my mm -hmm. grandmother. Oh. My mom was still like nine years old. Right. So, oh, so she God. got it. Okay. Is that bad? Yeah. Oh. Um, but what I was talking about was the, the train and some children. Some children got on the train, and the trains were really organized to go to England. My mother's brother, he ended up in a um, children's home on the property of the Rothschilds, which were very wealthy people. And not to say that it was a great like, summer camp vacation for years, but um, they went to school, they learned to trade, they helped with gardening and dishes and things like that. So it was a little more regular life. 
But for some reason, my mother did not get on the same train. And I think about splitting my kids, you know, the least thing is keep your you know, can of your family. I don't know enough about why, but my mom went on to um, a different place. And I think about my grandmother standing there and having to make a decision to, to, to put her children into the world somewhere with the chance that they would survive, with an even smaller chance that they would at some point um, meet again. I just can't even imagine how that would make me feel. So I already told you about the um, necklace. Okay. <coughs> My mother ended up in France. And a couple of things about France. There was a French organization called Ovo de Support. They um, were handling masses amounts of children. And, and they travel and put them in different children's homes. Um, just trying to stay ahead of the Nazis. And you think, well, the Nazis took over France, but in the very beginning, a program called um, Appeasement, the French gave up part of France to the Germans, thinking they thought that this way they had that part of the have our part. It was called Vichy France, but it was um, not, it was a political nightmare and did not work out well. But during that time, my mother was in children's homes in France, and periodically she would, uh, people would apply for her to come to the United States. And, you know, there are no computers, so you have to handwrite everything. So you get up to the place, you wait on, and they're like, oh, this, this tea is in question. Go back and do it again, and it never worked out completely. The problem was, every time she got denied, she ended up in a different children's home. Technical. Super view. Where's my DS question? Oh, see, that's going to be one point. I think I have this up. <laughs> we like you. Is it the end? Train? Yes. Okay, so my mother ended up in many different children's homes. So indeed, not even the sense of family. She literally would be with a group and then try to go, and that group moved on, and she took Amazing to me. Um, anyway, um, seven and eight. Um, so this is the children's home. My mother never wanted to speak badly of her experience. There's a couple of reasons. One is um, she didn't want me to be scared, and the idea of um, Jews being or a lot of minorities being picked on or marginalized is still so real for our country and other countries. And um, so she, she, she had some fears about that. We had a blackout once um, in New York City. It was a big blackout. And she had to get the bed because she thought we were going to We were like, no school. We don't have to do homework. And she's like, so big. Well, when we got out from the bed and turned on the radio, we still thought no homework. But she, you know, you know women in their candles. <laughs> we ended up doing it by candlelight. <laughs> um, but she always explained to me that living in the children's home, and this is one that she did live in, was they tried to make life as normal as possible. I think she learned how to make beds there because nobody had to teach me how to when I went to <laughs> Anyway, um, they had food, very little, but um, because goods were hard to get, so they had to do rationing. Um, this is much worse than having to move at home because you can get during COVID. Very good. It survived. Um, and one example that she tells that I was, was you know, I wanted to tell the story again. She was very tiny. Very small. My dad was a giant. Um, and 
they would run out of shoes for the kids. You know, you switch around and all this. And it's funny because shoes became a big issue at concentration camps. It's piles of shoes. It's just shoes throughout the thing. But she was so glad to get wooden shoes to wear in the snow. Because when you walked in the snow, the snow stopped and she was tall. Um, so this picture is one of those children's homes. And this is the director. And it's his birthday. And all the children came out to um, wish him a happy birthday, sing happy birthday. And this is my mother right here. I had to get to the front because she's so tiny. And this is the book. It's called Out of the Fire. And her picture is on the Oh, no. Ernest Papinac with Edward Lynn. Is it available? I'm not sure. Out of Fire? What's the name? Um, why don't we talk later? We can okay. Because right. I'm going to have everything out here to see. Thank you. Sure. If one will have an opportunity to look at the stuff yes. uh, after the presentation. I would be more than happy to um, have you do that. I'll have the dress here. Thank you. So, no problem. Um, another interesting thing is, during this whole time, my mother wrote letters. And my father wrote letters. And sometimes they would miss, and you may be wondering, if she's moving around, and he's from country to country, um, from Cuba to the United States, how did they write? Well, there was a distant relative who lived in Switzerland, which was a neutral country, and they sent the letters to this woman, and then she would send them on to the, the, the address she had at last. And they kind of came out of order sometimes, but the letters were truly a sign of luck. As long as these letters were going, you know, they had some connection. Well, it turned out my grandfather saved all the letters. And they're at the Holocaust Museum, and I have preserved copies because we felt like sharing it was better than letting it disintegrate. And um, you can come up and see this later. But it's very interesting because, first of all, the letters start in German. And she's got this child's handwriting and those little hearts over the I miss you and that kind of stuff. And it's messy and they scratching out. And then as she went to France and then to Switzerland, which we'll talk about in a little bit, she learned to write in Europe. Cursive was taught sometimes on graph paper. And you made each letter that fit the box. Surely not my handwriting. <laughs> And so as this, as she ages and as he, you know, the letters go up in dates, like this one is um, April 1st, I can't even read it. That's the problem, 1942. So these letters keep going and her handwriting just gets amazingly better. So um, these are in chronological order. I have not been able to find someone who won't take it from me or the copies will not put it up that they can do translation, because I'm sure there's things that aren't so happy that they shared and that I speak a little German and a little French, and I can make out a couple of words, um, but not enough to share with you. Okay, so no cell phones, no emails, no texting, so letter were their only way to communicate. Um, so children's homes, that kind of thing. At one point, the letters stopped coming. The German troops had advanced and taken over that Vichy France, and the Jews were being rounded up, shot in the street, having to dig trenches and then stand at the edge of it, being killed and put into the trenches or fallen, and sent to concentration camps in um, cattle cars and worse. So my mother was forced to go into and the most famous hidden child we all know is Anne, or most of us, but Anne Frank. But I want to explain to you a little bit about hidden children. There's a couple of terms that will make it a little clearer for all of us. There's the invisible kind. 
and Frank was invisible. He hid in basements, behind walls and barns, and um, some hidden children were in good situations where people took, took them in out of their in their heart and took care of them, fed them, let them read books, and that kind of thing. But they always lived in the fear of being found. And food was rationed, and the generosity to share the little bit that you have is an amazing thing. Um, I also know some situations where they were hidden that didn't turn out very well at all. I met a woman, and I'm um, using the ghost of a tour for the Anne Frank exhibit and my mother's exhibit. Um, and she was kept on the floorboards in the house for two and a half years. When she came out, she had records because she hadn't been in the sun for two and a half years, and it affected her her whole life as she was alone in the So then there's another kind of um, hidden child. They're visible. What that means is they pass us on Jews. Often these children lived with families, went to school, went to church, practiced the family's religion. Sometimes they were hidden in churches and brought up to never know what their true identity was. People were giving away babies that had no idea that they weren't the baby of the family they were in. But just take a moment and think about being separated from your parents, even if it meant your life could be saved. My mother became a hidden child. This is pictures of hidden children. Um, this is not actually my mom, but this is very similar to what I learned about it. Um, so uh, we spoke about her being in children's homes. Well, when the Germans took over France, a couple, a man and a woman, took a group of children, some boys and some girls, and they went into hiding on a farm. The farmer was very vague because his whole family was going And also sharing rations, you know, that wasn't an easy thing to do. He was a really good person. My mother said that they tried to make the best of it. They, um, they learned about their Jewish heritage from these two people, and they practiced holidays. They had school, and um, one thing was the townspeople were encouraged to tell on them. They were, you know, it was it was people just oh you did a good thing you got those Jews out of here. So. Um, They, as I said, they took school lessons in that. And they didn't even skip gym class. They had a gym class. What mostly it was was um, taking long walks in the woods, you know, hiking. Well, they kept the boys and girls very separate. One, the boys were in one barn and the girls were in another. You know, they had meals together and stuff. But the girls went on their hike. When they came back, the boys were gone. So we're picking them up and they were never heard from again. Um, so, what to do, what to do. That night, a couple of the girls were, um, well, the adults contacted the French underground. And the French underground, you've probably heard of, but there's a variety of ways that they um, stood up against the Nazi war machine. They fought, they um, organized people behind the scenes, got messages out to other people in other countries. They hid documents that um, are being found still today that document the facts of what happened. So, um, but the underground was contacted. So that night, they, um, I don't even know if they had a backpack mask out or whatever. But the border of um, Switzerland and um, France comes together. And the interesting thing is, well, as you know, not like some of the states that were carved out, like the Four Corners, Colorado, and you can see clearly the line. But where they were, the line was the river. So the resistance took them to a certain point and they said, we can't go any further. You follow this little river 
until it's low enough that you can cross. And when you cross, it's going to be Switzerland. They had no choice. They continued on. At one point, it was low enough to cross. They're about their feet in the water. They see, they see a gun. And they think, okay, after all this, we're done. It was a Swiss soldier lifting up the barbed wire. And he said, beep, beep, allez, allez. Which, you know, they can speak French and then come, come. So they were saved. Um, then they were taken to a deportation custom house. We've all heard about that in the news. Um, they had no papers, sound familiar. They had no passports or visas, and um, the borders were, were checked places. Um, they then went into a quarantine displaced persons camp near Geneva. And the sad part is things like this are still happening today, and you know, our awareness and what we can do about it is important to me. Um, but the good news is my mother started writing letters again. And it so happened that she had memorized the address of the lady that was taking the letters and sending it. So she wrote her. And she lived in Switzerland. So she came and took her to live with them. Um, and she continued to write in that kind of thing. And my mom says she was enrolled in school. It felt so good to be with a family, even if it wasn't her own. You know, she learned to clean house and she taught it. And most importantly, was able, like I said, to live in a family. Taking a bath once a week was a luxury, you know. It was, and she um, she talks about, you know, food was ration. But she said it was so fantastic. Um, Fridays, they would have chicken. And she either got the wing of the leg on Friday night and the opposite one on Saturday lunch. <laughs> So back in school, that my mom did. Um, well, this is the house that she lived in with the people. And I went there. Um, this isn't my photograph, but I have photographs of both of these that are identical. This is the synagogue, temple, house of worship that she went to with the family. So um, it's an interesting trip. So <clears throat> the war ends in May of 1945. This is a picture of my mother's passport. She's 14 years old. It took a year or more, a little bit more to get her process because all these people are trying to find their families. We didn't have the internet, so they make lists and then you check the lists and you've heard of my relative, you know, that kind of thing. Um, although the Germans did keep meticulous records so that people that um, were able to find out if their person was um, killed in the, in the concentration camp. So my mother's brother had already arrived here. In fact, he um, went into the army. And my great-grandmother, the woman who gave me the star, she survived concentration camp and lived to be 89, and I knew her. And um, my mom got on a boat, troop carrier, from Switzerland, came to the United States. She did tell the story of how seasick she got. First of all, those kind of boats were not, you know, cruising boats where you go for a vacation. Um, never had been on an ocean near the water. And the one story she tells is someone gave her a grapefruit, and she knew to peel it, but she didn't know to take that white stuff off. She said it was terrible. <laughs> So, she comes to Port in New York, and there's a game play, and she comes down, and there's her mother, her brother, her grandmother, and a man she didn't recognize, and it was her father, but she remembered him having this, you know, dark, wavy hair, and his hair was all white, and she, she was like, take it back, and when you don't see someone for seven years, that could possibly be the reality. Um, this is the high school my mother went to. And what's interesting about it, well, first of all, she didn't speak English. And she came in the summer, so that's the time she went to school. Um, and that was not, I mean, she listened to the radio, they put her in front of 
you know, it was called the TV at that time, and to learn English, but she already know, knows two languages. She went to high school, and I, I didn't put it here, but I had her first report card, and she got B's and B minus, and um, but she did get an A in one subject. That was French. <laughs> and this school, my apartment building where I was born and grew up was two city blocks down. So I could see it from my front window. I could hear the bells when it was changing periods. And um, I met a very good friend of mine. And we have done that. And her mother came to the school when my mother was there. They didn't know each other. But um, getting close to the end here. Um, I did not go to that high school. My parents moved to the suburbs. This was in New York City. My life took a different turn, I'm sure. Um, but what is the most um, moving thing for me is because my mother survived, I'm here. And this is an older picture. But my two daughters, my first grandbaby, and me. And, you know, like I said, I wouldn't be here. My mother passed away in my home after seven years of living with me with badly dementia and Alzheimer's on January 3rd, 2021. Um, that's mostly the end of my story, but I want to talk about one more thing. And, um, I, and again, this isn't something that you can actually read, but I, it's a, um, something to think about. You can Google genocide. It's the systematic wiping out of another group of human beings for a subjective reason. And ethnic cleansing that is currently going on was one of the goals of um, Nazis. So you want to eradicate another group for just being different. Um, many examples are perpetrated before World War II and continue now. Some of them that probably sound familiar are um, Bosnia, Syria, Pol Pot, Cambodia, Rwanda, Sudan, Darfur, and even the American Indians, Quid Pot, you know, fall into that category. And unfortunately, there are many more to add. Um, but why is it important? Well, learning about history and current events is our responsibility as people on this earth, and to, sh to share with us in the world that responsibility. But what can you do? Well, learning about the past is essential because we already repeat too much of the things that we um, can do better at. But staying up on current events is very important. And I don't know if y'all remember what I talked about when my uncle, my mother's brother, was thrown in the water and beat up for being Jewish. Well, that's an extreme, extreme bullying. So, what the organization, and actually this is from the Holocaust Museum, they call it the Pyramid of Hate, and I just want to take a minute and explain in short terms. Um, the first level are um, acts of bias, joking, rumors, stereotyping, non-inclusive language, like slurs, you know, and insensitive remarks. And I know some people say, language is just words, but to the person, it's tearing them down, and that can't work well to um, move on in the future in better ways. The next level is acts of prejudice, social avoidance, you know, you can't live here, ridicule, name calling, bullying, slurs, and dehumanization. So I can hit you because I don't think you're a full human, because you're X, Y, and Z. And one more level of that is acts of discrimination, economic, employment, education, political or housing discrimination, and segregation. And then the acts of bias motivated by violence, which is very prevalent today and scares me every day that it continues. There are threats, assault, rape, Murder, arson, terrorism, vandalism, and desecration. We've all heard stories about somebody just walking up and punching a stranger in the face. Um, 
So I don't want to focus on that. Those are the things, and look how high level it is for the pyramid. Finally, genocide. The act of or intent to deliberately and systematically annihilate an entire Whew. what what happens now? Well, there's resources, and again, I have a handout if you'd like to take one at some of these websites. But um, also another commercial for the Holocaust Speakers Bureau. Knowledge is power, just like words matter. And the more we learn about these things, um, it will help us not repeat them. So you have to work together against hate and understand that never again means now. And I appreciate all you coming out because I believe um, that people who come want to understand and use their knowledge for good. And I want to leave you with one quote. That's my mom on her birthday. She turned 85, and she, I realized she never had a birthday party. Mm -hmm. So I threw very colorful and all that, and um, it was rare for her to smile. She usually she smiled, but not very often. And this is just a look of amazement. Um, unfortunately, her Alzheimer's was raging at that point because she'd leave the room and come back and ask who the party was for. Wow. So, I want to leave you with this quote. All that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good men and women to do nothing. So I challenge you all to do something and continue to strive for all the things we talked about to not happen. And see something, say something. Someone uses a phrase, it's our obligation, I think, to let you know, you know, I, I understand what you're trying to say, I need you to know that that is her. And then, yeah, questions. <laughs> wait, 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 what was that? That's the beginning. Okay. Yeah, that's my first this is the written part of my stuff, so it really is. Um, happy to take questions. I'll lay out some of the stuff. Don't be shy. Yes, ma'am. You spoke about your mom. Do you know much of what happened to your father during those years? No, but yes and no. My father lived in a different part of Germany. His family had, um, his grandparents lived on the third floor, so his parents refused to leave because they wouldn't leave their parents. So they sent their children out. Um, they had three um, children. The youngest was my father. The oldest was a boy. Somehow we got to the United States and joined the Navy and rolled on into, you know, doing their job to fight against um, and sometimes they sent <laughs> Jewish people to like the Pacific because they were worried about spying and stuff. It would have made more sense because you could speak German and um, he ended up being sent to Switzerland and he never was of much for school and reading and writing. So he worked on a farm and was pretty much the wild child. I have one relative who's still alive, who was a little boy, and he would, my father would visit them in Switzerland on the weekends, and so he was kind of like an older brother to him. But one interesting thing is, after the war, my um, aunt, my father's sister, she had been a nanny, and I can't remember where, but she came to the neighborhood. So his brother and his sister convinced him to come to the United States. And he flew on the plane for the first time ever. Mm -hmm. you Taking know, in Switzerland too, and you're going by the mountains. It's not here. And, and, yeah. Um, but he came to this country. He rented a room. He, people rented out rooms in their apartments for a day. And 
he walked the streets and um, he saw a name on a marquee. He recognized the name because he didn't go to school very much, so he went with his dad when his dad went to sell cattle to neighboring um, orchards and, and, and other farms. Um, he recognized the name, and it was B-L-O-C-H, Block. He went in and he said, are you the Block that used to buy from, and it was a butcher shop. And he started by sweeping up the sawdust, remember when it had sawdust? And then he became, he worked there till, till he was not able to work anymore. Um, and it is interesting because there's been this whole Facebook communication about people who remember that butcher shop. Mm -hmm. And did I have the recipe? You know, they sh I, I, someone asked me for a picture of it, they posted it, it comes back to me. And I'm like, well, I'm the daughter of that guy in the picture. <laughs> and so they want to know, do I know how to make these specialties? <laughs> I couldn't even buy a steak. I didn't know how to buy meat because my dad always brought it home when I got married. <laughs> You know. So, um, one last point I want to make about him is, I told you he went to the room. You know how New York City blocks are square? He lived here on that block. My mother and her family lived here. A mutual, someone who worked with my grandmother who did sewing um, for a living, she introduced them. And they had everything in common. They both spoke German and French, and they had lost members of their family. And so they were married very quickly. And then came my brother, who now lives in Israel, and me. And they named me Marie because it was not an ethnic name. Uh, what? Really? St. Patrick's Day, I am fine being a <laughs> Very Any other questions? Yes. Tell us a little bit about your life. Okay. Um, I grew up in the neighborhood, and by a neighborhood I mean walking distance to where my father worked, walking distance to spend time with my grandparents. We belonged to um, a Jewish community. We were like there's Orthodox, conservative, and reform. We were conservative. The men didn't sit with the women. But the servants were in German. So oh, yeah. scared me to death. Because the guy would have, you know, like a little fire and brimstone, and I thought, that's Hitler in heart. <laughs> yes. But um, so New York City has changed in its ways of immigrants. And something that always bothered me was even Jewish people, like, we all have this, this horrible things happening. But the German Jews, when the um, Russian Jews came, they were like, you know, they were like, oh, we don't have to. And then the Russian Jews and the German Jews did not like when the Polish Jews came. And that always like, no, I was so frustrated. They all do. And they all went through traumas. Wow. Um, I then would have gone to that high school, but it had gotten not such a good place to, to uh, send. Child. So my parents moved to the suburbs of the community to work, and it really did change the trajectory of my life. I went to college in the Midwest. I met my now ex-husband, and I have two amazing daughters. Mm -hmm. so, and I am reformed Jewish now. I do practice, but um, more about doing the community than rituals. Mm -hmm. that, yes. Um, when your mother and the other little girls that night. Escaped and then they were in the communication. Right, and they got into Switzerland. Did she ever keep in touch with any of the other little girls or even the families that took care of her? Um, very good question. She definitely kept in touch with the woman who was passing the letter, so she lived with her, and then she passed away and her son. Um, nobody talked about this in my neighborhood, and I would say you were either Irish Catholic or German Jewish. It's like a neighborhood. And I went to school, PS 189, in public school. Um, and I just found out during COVID that a reunion of my public school, grade one through six, we kind of all went together. And I found out that 
probably nine out of ten people that parents will know this way that we never talked about. So and your mom comes to Yeah. Wow. And my parents has um, a little bit extra um, to carry around because they survived and they didn't put concentration camp. So survivor's guilt was very, very, very strong. And then in the 1980s, there was a convention in New York, in Venice's New York, of hidden children. Ooh. And that was interesting. She, and it was um, fortuitous, our next door neighbor was a hidden child too, which they yeah. figured out. So they went together, because it was the suburbs of the city. And they, um, they met people, and they were like, you know, like places to go around table to table to see names of people. They were in computers at that time. She has a book, and she has the pages marked with the people that she knew. And I don't know, I was, I was in college, no, I was done with college. And, you know, living my life. I was done with college, I was a mom, and, you know, um, I didn't follow that much. But an interesting thing happened. I mentioned to you that I lived in a lot of cities, but in Pittsburgh, there was a small Holocaust museum and they brought in speak, um, programs. And they had a program about Anne Frank. And I went to some classes and I learned to be the docent, you know, you talk. And I, it was a, like a long drive for me and I had two little children. And I said, yeah, I love doing this, but I'm not doing it next year, it's just too much. A lady called me and she said, you're going to dose in this next door. And I said, no, no, I told you, I, I just can't do it. She said, does the name Charlotte Wertheim? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. <laughs> so a small group of hidden children that live in Rockland County, New York, which is a suburb where my mom, um, you know, live, they put together a... Um, with the panels about their lives and then more information that the doses would bring. And when I took groups around, I said, my name is Maureen Wertheim. Remember that last name, Wertheim. It would become, it's a clue. And we go and people would go, that's your name, you know? And so, yeah. So it did kind of come full circle. Yeah. Yes? So have you done your family tree, genealogy, and? Good question. Um, I don't want to. Okay. I will tell you why I asked. Um, is because so my fourth cousin, we are a German Jew. Um, from my, I, I'm so my great 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 grandfather was German Jew. Um, and so one of his brothers married a Wertheim. Yes. So I'm wondering. That's yes. Yeah. Interesting. So we have family that were part of the Well, not yeah. I don't. Not our side because I'm the sphere, and he married. Well, oh, and I But my that. cousin would be related. I run into that because the name Wertheim is the name of the city, and what I understand and what I think is, you know, there were castles, and then there were the serfs that worked on the farms. They didn't have last names, so they were Karl Heinz of Wertheim. So they paid their taxes and you know that. And then when that feudal system died out, they were Wertheim. Just like we have names of streets that are like Indian, like why would we have it? But it was a tra especially in Atlanta, the, the trail was called that, and now we name it Street. And also peach fruit, that's another <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, um, and I've got two or three friends who want to work time, but they're not really. Yeah. So that's why I was wondering. Yeah, it's a new I don't want to say it was like Smith, but it is a little more. In fact, there was a department store for work hunters in my neighborhood. And clearly my parents didn't know. <laughs> but when I was, Asked to be the sorority, and all the girls were asking me, What did you thought you'd do? I called my parents, so I was like, you know, 17 and a half. And I didn't want to say butcher because they were all, you know. And I said, Oh, you know, the department's right <laughs> 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 The dinner was great. <laughs> <laughs> I, it wasn't my 
<laughs> Any other question? Yes. Are, are you familiar with the Bill of Company? Yeah, Bill. The Bill of Lost and Other Slaves. I've heard of it, yeah. The names of children that were crossing over and the social program. I think it was the existence of the Yeah, yeah. That's a wonderful book. Thank you. You yeah. know, you would enjoy that. And, and I'm wondering if your mom's name might be in that book. I mean, there really was a book. Yeah. yeah. What is it again? There is so much literature, and I have to admit something to you, and maybe this will explain it for me. I have not gotten into the Holocaust Museum. Oh, I can understand. I have taken marching band trips, we went through because our, our um, competitions were close by, and there were a couple other kids that didn't want to go, so we did something else. Now, I think I'm ready now. My mother never wanted my father to go because my father had recognition of people's faces and she was worried that he would break down. And, you know, he, he did talk about his life. But I think this survivor guilt was really a big thing for him, although we never talked about it. But you can see, you know, people get ill from, from their emotions sometimes. And his health declined way faster than that. Definitely my mother's or Yes. Well, thank you for having me. I really wish and hope that you um, will find other places for me to go speak because I would love to come back and um, that you take away the message of, you know, humans don't need to be very if people do have other questions when they get home, oh, I should have asked. Feel free to reach out to me here in the library at Tazon. Any information or any questions that may be getting answered? Yes, you can go to me. So, the question I have is where did where have I lived? Like, I was born and raised in New York City. I went to college at Ohio State and Michigan State, Chicago, Denver, Chicago, Denver, Atlanta, Pittsburgh, and here. I am a professional pilot. <laughs> I'm an army brat. I was a corporate trailing scouts. And the trail kind of got lost a little bit. Yes. Thank you very much. Thank you all for coming.